Hi, my name is Tony McLaughlin, and I'm talking to Nat Sakimura from the Open ID Foundation. Nat, thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. It's my honor to join your session. Hey, Nat, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in digital identity in the first place. All right, so um, it's, you know, a little bit complex and multiple, you know, layered. Uh, one of the biggest personal reasons was actually because of the surgery my daughter had. It was a failure. Mm -hmm. And I had to get out of her in the medical records and things like that from the hospital, but it wasn't possible at the time. There was mm -hmm. no legislation, things like that. There was no technology either. So, you know, I started working on it. That was one of the reasons. The other one is my other background, the security and things like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, to secure the communications over the internet, I mean, mm -hmm. identity management is the, you know, first square. And without it, you won't be able to get very far. So, yeah. so you know, and these things combined, yeah. And you are the, the chairman of the Open ID Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Yeah, right. So um, what I'm actually doing is uh, mainly creating the international standards for identity management, as well as the privacy protection. Well, um, identity management thing is, especially on the, on the wire, is being done at the Open ID Foundation. And I also work in ISO very much. I'm actually the head of delegate for from the Japanese national body to ISO for the privacy related stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing the uh, privacy stuff down there. But you know, when you look at the holistic picture, identity in, well, at least in the Open ID Foundation, the ISO world, it is a set of attributes mm. about entity. And if that entity is a living human being, identity, quote unquote, becomes personal data. So yeah. it, it's on the flip side of the coin, the both identity management and privacy. Now, one of the, the applications of your work, um, you've developed a standard called FAPI, which has been very much used in the implementation of open banking. So what is FAPI? All right, so FAPI actually is uh, the profile of OAuth and OpenID Connect. So I actually would have to start explaining this unless yes. all of you guys know it, right? Um, OAuth is the um, access delegation protocol, right? Mm. So um, if you want an app or service provider access to the data that you manage, you know, there are two ways to give you a credential like password. Yes. Or give a scoped access. Mm. Now, um, I, I guess you know about the screen scraping. Yes. Screen scraping is taking your password and it can do pretty much anything you could, mm. right? Which is not desirable from the security and the privacy point of view. Of course. Right? And um, so uh, ideally, you want to do a scope of access. Mm. And actually, my employer uh, started doing screen scraping back in year 2000. And they came to me, they came to me that, do you think that's a good idea? And I told them, it's a very, very bad idea. <laughs> but SAML is, SAML is another you know, authentication standard. SAML is expected coming two, three years time so you should be able to get out of that screen scraping business by then it should be okay so as a temporary measure i'd accept it now but of, of course screen scraping is still prevalent even yes today. after 20 years it still <laughs> is right so um but anyways so the auth is one of the technology which is badly needed to move yeah. out from that screen scraping thing and one of the analogies that I think I've heard you use to describe OAuth is, um, you know, valley parking. Uh, you know, when you give your keys to the to the valley to park your car, it doesn't mean that the valley is you. Right. 
so a lot of people actually conflates between uh, the access authorization and or authorization delegation, mm. access, I mean, access delegation and user authentication, right? Yeah. You having given the permission for the valet to drive your car doesn't mean he is you, right? Yes. <laughs> it's quite obvious in the you, you know, real economy and or in real world. life, but when it gets to the, the cyber space, a yeah. lot of people just confuse it. Absolutely. So right. cyber, oh. Cyberspace does seem to be a strange domain um, with slightly different rules. Um, you know, and people seem to make very kind of like obvious mistakes. Again, for example, coming back to screen scraping. So you're working open ID, I, I guess, as you're trying to build up these standards and you're working ISO is build up these standards so that the kinds of uh, privacy that we would expect in the physical world can also be experienced in the digital world. Is that a, is that a fair way of thinking about it? Yes, to be treated fairly in the cyberspace. You know. Right. So, uh, but the problem in the cyberspace is that, you know, what was possible implicitly in the mm. real world because of physical existence cannot be assumed, right? Yeah. And <laughs> that's the source of all sorts of problems. And that's yeah. what we are trying to solve. And after like some 25 years, we are mm. still working on it. So I, I'm interested in, uh, other comments that I've heard you make about, um, you know, identity as a service. And I, I've heard you say that traditionally um, corporations were very, you know, app focused or application focused and had identity in each of those applications. And you, I think you encourage uh, this idea of bringing out identity as a service. Can you expand a little bit more on that concept? All right. So, um, you know, traditionally, each application had its own identity stack. I and mean, let's face it, if you want to do any kind of access management, you need to have mm -hmm. identity management. Um, but having those, uh, you know, identity management embedded in each application means that a lot of duplication and out of sync stuff, right? Yes. And uh, start causing a lot of problems. Mm. And also, uh, if you are actually building it in a monolithic kind of architecture, I mean, you, you might want to put, you know, be uh, to make sure that the change that you make to one application wouldn't have repercussion on the others and things like that. But that's going to be very hard. Mm -hmm. and um, causes a lot of uh, wars and costs, mm -hmm. All right? Uh, one of the company who actually moved out from that kind of architecture in the early days was Amazon. Mm -hmm. So Amazon actually pulled, pulled the identity stack out and started turning application into the services. Yes. That calls the identity as a service. Yeah. Right. So uh, whenever you actually uh, check out with Amazon, you're running OpenID. Yeah. Oh, uh, interesting. And, and so thinking about that broader than the um, individual company level, um, we've seen the development of you know national ID schemes, for example. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. India. Um, which has almost provided, if you like, identity as a service at a national level. And there are other models, for example, in the Nordic countries, we have uh, federated bank ID schemes, like the mm -hmm. bank ID in Sweden and Belgium, we have the federated scheme, it's me. Yeah. And, and furthermore, there's another model out there, which is the kind of self-sovereign identity model where mm -hmm. really people can keep their own credentials. So, um, is this concept of identity as a service applicable at the level of cyberspace, at the level of nation states? Um, so wh where should that identity layer sit? With the government, with uh, consortiums of banks and others, um, or should I look after my own credentials? 
So, um, you know, it's a very common misconception that there is only one identity per person, right? <laughs> we actually maintain many identities, right? Uh, the identity towards the government, identity towards the banks, identity towards your family. You show different aspects of you. That means you show different attributes about you, the set mm. of attributes. That's identity, right? And um, in many cases, for example, government uh, central identity management is centered around government use case. Mm. Um, in many cases, for example, in Japan, where I live, uh, government is very particular about name, date of birth, address, yes. and gender. Why? Because that's the key for the entitlement database that they have, right? Mm -hmm. So that's very important. And it's very important to make sure that these attributes are correct, right? Mm -hmm. And is correctly bound to the physical being as well. Well, you know, if your entitlement database or policy database is based on, for example, email address, all of these four attributes are actually quite irrelevant. Yes. Right? And in the case of bank, uh, I mean, because of the EKYC, you, you'd have a whole bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. like uh, whether you are not PEP, PP or not, and something like that, right? And then that gray database may be keyed with something that yeah. you guys maintain. For example, in Japan, for at least invest, investment banks, we are using uh, driver's license number. I see. Right? Because it's actually pretty easy to launder your name and address. I mean, if you move from one address to another, the link is deleted. If you yeah. get married to somebody and change your you know, family name, your know, name is laundered. So yes. if you're using those four key, four attributes as a key, it will it, it will never match those people yes. who you really want to match. Absolutely. So we're using driver's license number, which is not being which is not getting changed except the last digit. Hmm. And as you see, as you see the development of open banking around the world, again many of those implementations using your standards. Um, surely this points to something a bit more than open banking. It's not just about, you know, you or I having the ability to share our banking data with third parties, but um, do you see that extending into this concept of like an open data economy where you can choose to share your data with, you know, whichever third party in a secure manner? Yes, um, definitely. The protocol wise, there's nothing specific to banks course mm. i mean the banks have to uh, define the payloads that's for sure mm. and other industry has to define you know other payloads format but from the security and pipe uh, point of view yes that you know, industry and use case agnostic it's so agnostic. it can be used yeah for so anything I guess then you, what you really need is um, I, one of the enablers is the underlying uh, policy framework to enable this to happen. You know, open banking in Europe was driven by the PSD2 regulation. So I guess what you would need is to have, uh, you know, a privacy law or a data sharing framework that would enable data subjects to have that right to share data and then some regulations around the standards. Yeah, like uh, data portability, for example. Right. Indeed. And uh, in the GDPR, the portability is talked a lot, but I mean, without the protocols, yeah. it's not really portable. You know? Exactly. Yeah, you're right. And it's uh, Article 20 of GDPR, it says that data portability is uh, you if know, possible, <laughs> but it doesn't specify how it's going to happen. It just says yeah, machine, right. readable, machine readable format is the only requirement, yeah. I think. Yeah, right, right. Um, well, unless there's a standard for that, you can't actually move the data from one provider to another. Yeah. So as an, as an identity expert, then, um, when you look upon, for example, the issues that the payments industry have had in terms of strong customer authentication, you know, in, in Europe, for example, strong th customer authentication has been a, a big point of controversy because you know, implementing these methods at, at checkout 
uh, introduces friction for the user and friction for the user leads to lost sales for the merchant. Um, so as, a, as an identity expert, my question is this, can you really square the circle between having high security, high privacy and good, good customer experience? Or are these things fundamentally a trade-off? Are they un- incompatible? I believe that good security actually can result in better user experience as well, mm. right? So for example, uh, uh, let's say uh, you had a hardware protected key pair on your phone and you needed a facial biometrics or fingerprint or something like that to unlock that key to do the secure customer authentication. Yes. That's, that experience probably is much better than typing in password. Mm. And for the user, it's just looking at the screen. It's gone. It's done, right? Yeah. So, and it's much more secure than password, for sure. Right. So um, good security doesn't have to mean bad user experience. Mm. In fact, uh, in many cases, it's the other way around. Good security may actually mean good user experience as well. Now. Yeah. There's a caveat. You can always screw it up, right? <laughs> For example, in the in case of PSA2, you have a uh, requirement to re-authenticate every 90 days, Indeed. right? Yeah. And if you have 100 applications, that's a nightmare. <laughs> it's a nightmare, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. right. well, it's so that's not a technology problem. It's just a policy problem, you know? It's a policy problem. Um, yeah, and, and very interesting how the policy and the technology interacts. But it does seem to me that, um, you know, as a result, for example, of the work that you're doing at the Open ID Foundation, things are moving in the right direction. Maybe in another 20 years, we'll see the end of screen scraping. Um, but my final question to you is, uh, you know, as, as you reflect on the changes brought about the pandemic, by the pandemic, Uh, Everyone is saying, I mean, the most obvious thing for anyone to say is that digital is accelerating as a result of the pandemic. Um, But what what does that mean? What does that mean for you in terms of the role that standards will play privacy, uh, digital identity? Surely these things become much more important if we're going to live in a more digital world. Right. So uh, this pandemic thing has advanced the people's perception quite a bit. I think in three months, we gained like five years worth of mm. perception. Yes. And the progress in the in terms of the use. Of course, then at the same time, people weren't that much prepared. Mm. So a lot of solutions are actually patchwork and need to be solved and need, need to be corrected. Mm. But um, in general, it's showing promise that it's going to move to the right direction. Now, the caveat is that in this kind of crisis, people uh, tend to oversimplify the problems. Mm. For for example, uh, you know, people tend to say that uh, we should enable the governments to track anybody all the time, 24 hours a day to track the COVID-19 stuff. Okay, yeah, that could be legit, but that also make the governments capable of, I, I don't want to go into that, but yeah. so um, you have to also look at the side effect of the mm-hmm. things. So that's the peril of this kind of crisis time. Wow. And that's where we professional have to, you know, tell people, you might just want to slow down a little bit, right? <laughs> we make a steady progress, right? Yes. And but, uh, I'm confident that we can do that. And um, it's probably going to happen. Well, that's a, a couple of great messages there. One is that you can have good security, good privacy, and uh, good customer experience, and also that 
in this crisis, um, hopefully we don't reach for the, um, the very obvious solutions that may have unintended consequences. But I, I want to you know, thank you for spending time with us today. You're uh, one of the eminent voices in this space, one of the leaders in this space. I can highly recommend to the audience to take a look at your highly entertaining uh, series of videos, OAuth in two minutes, uh, which certainly helped me understand the subject a lot better and uh, gave me a few laughs along the way. Uh, but Nat, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. You're very welcome. It was my you know, honor to be in your you know, channel. Thank you, sir. Thank you.